Welcome everyone to episode number one of Smack Talk with Sandu. And when I started to think about who I wanted my first guest to be, it was very easy. It was going to be someone who I consider the best of the best. He's a, you know, I could introduce him actually as a 13-time fighters only journalist of the year. I could introduce him as the host of the MMA Hour, the host of the Ringer MMA show, on-camera talent for Showtime Sports, interviewer on-camera talent for, for BT Sport, amongst a plethora of other gigs he has in the business. But instead, I'm going to introduce him as my friend and a loyal colleague. It's none other than Ariel Helwani. Oh, what a legend. Uh, what an honor to be guest number one. Congratulations. I know you've been thinking about this. Mm -hmm. uh debating planning all this stuff for a long time what a setup you have putting my fake setup to shame because that's right. a real setup what a microphone what a camera you've never looked better what a sweatshirt you've got going on there i mean the whole thing is just primo it's it's all downhill from here because i don't know how you top this listen it ain't no library like yeah i can't claim to read as many books as you but no, it's a little true. something something i put together you know in five minutes before we start to go on there it's fantastic. Congrats on the uh, the launch of all of this. And uh, it's good to see you back doing interviews because you were doing them for several years before mm -hmm. you started to focus on the social and all this stuff. So it's good to see you yeah. back in the mix. Yeah, it's been like four or five years. And I have to admit, I've got some nervousness, but it's like nervous excitement energy because I have missed this. And so, like I said, I don't want anyone else to be on except for you because You've been very good to me. You've helped me a lot in the business and uh, I appreciate you being uh, guest number one here. My pleasure. And you've helped me out a lot as well, especially over the last few years. So anything I could do. I appreciate it. Well, look, what I'd like to do is start back in summer of 2021. Right? And okay. I, and I know you've already been through everything that you went through at ESPN, but if you could go back and in time and, and speak to the aerial of summer of 2021 and say, hey, you know what? In less than two years, you're going to have all these gigs like MMA Hour, Ringer MMA Show, BT Sport, stuff for WWE, Showtime, you know. Like, I know you, when we spoke, you said that you were going to put together a puzzle. Yeah. And at that time, I thought to myself, oh, it's like a nice little three or four piece puzzle. Now I feel like with the, all these gigs that you've got on your plate, it's like one of those, one of those 3D models, oh my 3D God. puzzle pieces. I love it, man. And uh, yeah, if I could talk to that guy, obviously, there was a part of me that was a little nervous, right? You're wondering, okay, you're you're leaving the dream job because going to ESPN was my dream. Um, and I have no regrets whatsoever about going there. And I don't have any regrets about leaving. Um, I don't know if everyone feels the same way, but I feel like, you know, we left on good terms. And sometimes as, you know, there was an interview that I did on the Dan Lebitard show just a couple of weeks after I left. And I still think it's their uh, most viewed um, video on their YouTube channel. And I think it's because a lot of people thought that I was, you know, criticizing ESPN. I wasn't. I was criticizing more the UFC and and maybe it was the title and all this stuff. But really, like, I, I, I don't have many complaints. Of course, I can complain about that. We could all nitpick. We could all complain about our jobs. But overall, it was just the right time to go. I wasn't fired, contrary to what uh, the haters uh, want to say I was offered a deal. It was for the same money that I was making. And uh, I just, I wanted something else and I wanted freedom. And there were a few signs along the way towards the end, you know, I was asked to work on the Ben Askren, Jake Paul fight. I had to say no because I was asked not to do it, all this stuff. And I just wanted the freedom to do as much stuff as possible. And sometimes I've equated this to someone who was in like a long-term relationship and then all of a sudden they become signal, single. And then all of a sudden it's almost like they become uh, very promiscuous. They just want to go everywhere with everyone. And I can, I can see someone being like, whoa, Ariel, chill out. Now I've seen some people say, by the way, that I've had to get so many jobs just to offset what I was making, like to equal what I was making at ESPN. Not the case, just for the record. I think it's just, I like to work. I, mm. I really like to work. I like to be busy. And I'm so happy that I've been able to kind of be a little bit of Switzerland in the broadcasting world where I can do work with this guy and that guy and that guy. And sometimes it's with, dare I say, competitors, HBO and Showtime. There was a day last year where I hosted the press conference for Jake Paul Hasim Rahman, which never happened, 
uh, for Showtime. Then I went to the MMA Hour Studios to do the Nate Diaz special. Then I went to the HBO Studios to voice my real sports beats on bird watching. That was all in the span of 10 hours. And I left HBO at night. It was like 10 p.m. And I sat in my car and I said, this is the freaking greatest life of all time. I am so lucky to be doing this. And then a couple of weeks later, I went to Nashville to do Summer Slam for BT. It's just, I like to do different things. I like that everything is unique, different. Nothing overlaps. Nothing feels like I'm doing something, you know, the same for the other guy. Um, it just all feels fresh, fun. I feel energized. I feel excited to take on the day. I feel very, very lucky. It, it, there was a chance it wasn't going to work out this way. But, you know, I, 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 I thank God every day and I am somewhat of a religious person. I thank God every day for putting me in the spot and making it all work out. Now, was the goal to always be this busy? Like when you... Hell yeah. Came, so you wanted to take as much on as you possibly could and, and be in different buckets and segments of the biz. A thousand percent. And let me tell you this, uh, there are, well, there's one thing uh, that is a done deal, but I can't announce it just yet, that is going to be added to the plate. And I don't mean to be coy with you, but it's just, uh, you know, I don't want to piss them off before I start. And there's another thing in the oven right now wow. that was just put in the oven and it's baking. And that could be another thing. And that could be maybe one of the most exciting things um, in addition to all the other stuff going on. So yes, I, and I say to myself, because like just to go down and, and this is not me, I'm, I'm just, I, I just want to like explain to people in case they don't know, uh, we've got the MMA hour, we have uh, the Ringer MMA show, the stuff with BT Sport, which I adore, soon to become TNT Sports, um, shout out. Uh, the stuff with BetMGM, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, the stuff on my personal YouTube page, have the Substack, have the Showtime stuff, have the HBO, real sports stuff. That's all the stuff right now. And I pray to God that I'm not forgetting anything. Um, and, and I want more. Like I, I'm hungry for more. I'm looking for more. There was actually one thing that fell through and I thought it was a done deal. Like I was, I was count, and I learned a lesson. I was counting my chickens before they hatch. I thought it was a done deal, and this would have been amazing. And it fell through at the eleventh hour, and so that made me hungry for more. I want more. I want more. So I don't know if I'm just an insane person, but I'm way less happy when I'm not working. I want to work. I, I want to be busy. Like today, I've had like five things back to back, and give me eight. I want to do more. Do you ever even fear burnout? No. No, I, I'm, I'm pretty good. Look, if you do things that you love, if you mm. do things that give you joy and excitement, like what's better than this? I fear being lazy. I fear being bored. I, feel, I fear being um, uninspired, not excited to do my work. Like that was always my fear. You know, I saw some people who I grew up with and they were doing jobs that I was like, I can't, please God, don't let me do this. Like, please God, because it could easily happen, like take me down a path where I'm doing some nine to five desk job, which by the way, is a great living. And there's a lot of people who are thrilled. It's just not for me. It never was for me. Going back to my time at Spike TV, lasting one week there and then telling them I had to go because I just didn't, the idea of sitting at a cubicle was was like a death sentence to me. I, I just couldn't do that. Oh, I'm going to put on my nice shirt and my nice pants and I'm going to go to work. It's just not for me. So I like that every day is different. I like that every day is fun. Let me work. Let me do as much as possible. Um, Maybe in five years, I'll tell you, God, in retrospect, I was adding too much to the plate and I burnt myself out. But right now, like I said, I want to do more. And does it help that you can do a lot of this stuff from home? Because I know you've mentioned in the past, the UFC schedule when you were on the road so much was so tough for you because it was time spending away from your family. But now yeah. you could do so many things from home. It doesn't really interfere too much, I would imagine. thousand percent. Um, I've said no to things that required travel that maybe in the past I would have said yes to. But, you know, the great thing about, uh, I guess, being my age now and, you know, 17 years of doing this, which blows my mind. I started in 2006, this particular like path of being media, right? Not in back of the camera because for two and a half years after graduating, I was in production and then I switched over. Um, it's that, you know, now you can maybe be a little more selective, right? So if I was traveling, like, I don't want that life. I do not want that life. The The life of traveling every weekend, no thank you. The life of traveling every month, no thank you. Every two weeks, no thank you. Now, if it's a big deal, like we're going to be at WrestleMania, can't wait. It's big. It's important. It feels like it's worth missing soccer on the weekend, missing my kids and all that stuff. Tank Davis, Ryan Garcia, sign me up. But if it's like, you know, some random event and we're just going through the motions, like it felt like we were towards the end, 
no thanks. Now I'm still going to cover it and I'm mm. still going to give you a ton of content around again. I'm going to give you, you know, four hours on Monday, five hours on Wednesday, another 90 minutes on the Ringer MMA show, a post show. Like I'm doing more than ever. It's just not the same old go to the media day, go to the press conference. Uh, it's not for me. It was a great thing. It was an amazing thing. And there's great people doing it. But, you know, I, I like to feel challenged. And and right now it doesn't feel like it's a challenge. Doesn't it feel like just the perfect time and the perfect moment in terms of what you've gone through over the last couple of years? Perhaps these opportunities just weren't available, say, 10 years ago with what's happened in social media, what's happened in sports media, technology, Zoom, to be able to work remotely like we can. Like, was this even an option for you 10 years ago? Or did you have to be like, I need to work for a company. I can't really do this solo by myself, be independent. Hell, one. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, wasn't an option three years ago. It wasn't mm. an option before the pandemic, like even the room that I'm sitting in now wasn't really a thing. And I had to make it into a thing because of the pandemic, right? Doing the show with DC, doing the show with Chael for ESPN. Um, I mean, the idea of doing, a couple of weeks ago, I had uh, Volkanovsky on the MA Hour and we did that at my house here because he was in Perth and the time difference was too crazy. And I wanted to get him 24 hours after the loss to Islam Khachev. That would never happen. Um, in the summer, Hamza Chemaev hits me up on IG and he's like, let's do the interview right now. That wouldn't happen. It couldn't happen. I didn't have the setup. I didn't have the knowledge. I didn't have the technology. We didn't have the technology. And so now getting to do stuff on my YouTube channel, my personal YouTube channel, getting to sometimes do stuff for uh, the MMA hour, getting to do stuff for the ringer all from home. I don't think, one thing that I learned from uh, the DC and Helwani days I used to be afraid of my stuff looking subpar, not looking pro. What I learned was, and I try to make, I mean, it's not as pro as you, but I, oh. I try to make it all right. Um, I realized that the fans, like, they just want the good content. If it's mm. good, it doesn't have to look like super duper studio pro. Now, I love that I have my studio, and that's a main reason why I came back to, one of the reasons why I went back to the MMA hour. But um, they're just happy if it's good. They're happy if it's from home. They don't care. They really don't. And I didn't really know that. And I was afraid of that. Even, I mean, I, I would even argue, and, and and you would know better than I would since you're, you know, an expert in this field. But like, it seems like the younger demographic, like they are even more drawn to if it's shot on your phone, if it's selfie mm -hmm. style, like they couldn't care less. It, like the less manicured it is, it's almost the better for them with TikTok and all this stuff. So yeah, wasn't an option 10 years ago, five years ago three years ago, but I'm glad it's an option now. Perfect segue into what I want to do right now. I want to go around the horn with oh. all these gigs and everything that you have. You came back with the MMA Hour, back at Vox Media. It was a beautiful little teaser trailer that you guys dropped where you just kind of put the cans back on, don't say anything. What's that been like? Because from a viewer, from just a fan perspective, and looking at the metrics and how the show has changed, it almost feels like I mean, I know you'd love to book guests and, and interview fighters and other people in the business, but with what you have going on with Eric, GC, Frank, and even, you know, when you're kind of doing on the nose, yeah. those tend to be the most viewed videos from the show every single week. Is that a surprise? And, and like, was that something that you planned or even thought could be, become a success from the show? That was, uh, that was the goal. That's what I wanted. Um, because I grew up idolizing someone named Howard Stern. And in my opinion, he's the best interviewer of my lifetime and one of the best broadcasters of my life. And my favorite stuff from his show, I loved his interviews, but what I really loved, like what would make me laugh and what I would tune in for was the banter with his, with his crew, right? That's mm. what I really admired. And I always wanted that. So that's why you know, when I met Eric right away, I wanted him to be an on-air personality. Like when, 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 when I first met New York Rick, he, he wasn't interested in that, but I really wanted him to do that. And, and I thought of ways to get him more involved with making picks before it was, you know, on Vogue and everyone was doing it. Um, that's why when I met our fellow friend TST, I wanted, he, he knew nothing, but I was like, that's okay. I like personalities. I like quirky people. I like when there's a lot of voices. And again, I don't know what it is, about my life and if there's someone looking down. But, you know, when I went back to the MMA hour, we were looking for a new producer because New York Rick was doing the social stuff. And at the time he was still with ESPN. And we went through, I don't know, 50 candidates and- 50? Yeah, we went through a wow. ton. 
Um, and I was on some of the Zoom calls and everyone was just it, w- good people, but just not the fit. And and maybe I was thinking like, how do I get the chemistry with Eric? And, and you can't do that because he's my friend. He's one of my best friends. And mm-hmm. you can't recreate that in two seconds, right? Um, and thank the good Lord. One of the one of the best things, and, and dare I say, one of the only good things that TST has ever done for me. I'm joking, of course. Is uh, suggest a young man named Connor Burks who was working at ESPN Radio at the time, and said, "Hey, you know, maybe he could be um, a candidate." And I mean, like, what a, what a find GC has been. He has been unbelievable. And and uh, you know, I feel bad for him because now we've realized like he's incredible at video production, at Photoshop, and all this stuff. And he's doing so much more, and he's become a great on-air personality. And then I find Frank, the audio guy, and he's incredible. And now all of a sudden, I feel like I have my Howard Stern show. I have my Fred. I have my Robin. I have my Baba Booey. And and this is exactly what I wanted. And so my favorite segments. You know, it's funny. Like when 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 Brendan was making fun of me, and he's like, "Oh, you know, fourteen guests on the show." I will always love talking to the fighters. I will. Mm. It's always a privilege, whether it's Joanne Wood or Dricus Duplessis or or Francis or Voke or Izzy. It's a privilege to talk to them, especially after big moments or before big moments, and have that access and 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 give that access to the people. And I will never stray away from that. But it's also so much fun to just shoot with the boys, right? To have fun, mm. to the banter, um, the inside jokes. I, I look forward to going there and hanging out. We have the darts board that I put up, like we play afterwards. And some of the guys who aren't even on air, you know, like the Joes of the world that I reference sometimes, we play like the camaraderie is so much better than when it was when I left. That's amazing. Then I have the stuff with, you know, the ringer guys and, and TST is a part of that as well. Like it's just very important for me to have other voices. I never wanted it to just be my voice. I wanted to have like a, a universe. And and the best shows in sports, in my opinion, have that formula. McAfee, he has other voices with him. Lebetard has other voices with him. Um, Rich Eisen has other voices. Dan Patrick has other voices. Those are the best shows. And so I try to do that in our little world. So the funniest segment in the history of the show, in my opinion, was always the pre-Beck interview, right? Ah, yes. But then... GC presents the cursed t-shirt segment Amazing. and like I, w- I kid you not I was dying <laughs> tears streaming down my eyes and man I just got it's like 1a 1b for me now in terms of history of the show in terms of moments I just absolutely wow. pop that's yeah. high praise yeah I mean I don't know where pre-beck is these days but GC is killing it he is he is he is a great great talent he's a joy to work with uh, no issues no egos I love hardworking people I, I don't like lazy people. I don't mm. like apathetic people. Like he goes all in. And what I love about him is like, he is so new to MMA. All this is fresh, fun, new, exciting for him. He loves getting all the merch. I think you could appreciate that. I think you're a fan of merch as well. Like he just goes all in. And I, I like the fact, by the way, like I can't, sometimes I stray a little bit, but I can't be a fan in the sense that I can't openly root. He mm. can openly root. He's not a journalist. He doesn't want to be a journalist. So I think it's fun to have that element of him openly rooting for uh, a Jack Della Maddalena type of guy. You know, um, I think that that makes it really fun. And I think that people can relate to that. Plus, I mean, his knowledge of gambling and, uh, you know, just like how into it he gets is great. And it's something that everyone has to have in this day and age with sports media. It's just a necessity. So he's been amazing. By the way, uh, and I, I love working and I can't even imagine a second, um, you know, uh, of, of this show continuing without him. He's just a math. He's part of the fabric. Like Frank, um, there was a chance that he was going to leave. And I was like, the show, can- like he is now, he has to be a part of the show. He is a part of the show. It would feel very empty without him. Prebeck, by the way, I did find, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but I did find him on Instagram and I wrote to him. I thought, I thought Prebeck had died because he mm. just fell off the face of the earth, but he moved to the West Coast. He is alive and well. He's doing okay. He just doesn't want anything to do with the limelight. But I found wow. him around a year ago and it was one of the great finds. I think it was Edward Kim of uh, the Ringer MMA show fame that found him first, if my memory serves me correct. And I was so happy because, I mean, he was a talent as well. Could you imagine him coming back now and doing, you know, impersonations of the new characters in the sport? Oh, uh, yeah. So many, right? I mean, like so Connor, he was pre-Connor. Mm-hmm. That's how long ago it was. Crazy. Um, but yeah, Walid Ismail and uh, Nathan Diaz, uh, Vitor Belfort, just legendary stuff. 
classic. Other thing I want to mention about GC is he almost represents the the new fans that have mm. come during the pandemic. And I put a poll up when John Jones was fighting, and like thirty five percent of people had said they'd never seen John Jones fight live before, which wow. in a way blew my mind, but also made makes total sense because there has been so many new fans that have come into the sport because of the pandemic and UFC, ESPN, and I guess GC is representative of that new audience and the new demo as well, right? Thousand percent. I mean, it's he he represents all the different you know new um, fan bases. The ESPN era, he comes from ESPN. The betting era, he comes from that world as well. And the pandemic era, like that's, I mean, that's been a huge part of the UFC success since the pandemic. The fact that they were in ESPN and there wasn't a lot going on. So ESPN was really pushing them. The fact that gambling is so um, prevalent and, 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 and sanctioned and legalized now is huge for them. And, you know, the fact that, like I said, there was nothing going on, like people just had to watch and all those things combined was just a massive success. I know that it was uh, polarizing it was uh, something that a lot of people felt a certain way about. But in the end, it ended up being worth the risk for the UFC because I think they became even more popular. And that's really how GC became so into the sport. So, yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of people can relate to that. Like, I, I, I'm not surprised to hear about your poll and the results. Um, I bet there's a lot of people who are big, fa- you know, like there's the Connor era fans, there was the Fox fans and going back, there's the tough fans, right? Then there's the Fox fans, then there's the Connor era fans. And there's definitely the ESPN slash gambling slash, you know, pandemic fans. And I think he's in that category and he owns it. He doesn't fake it. He doesn't mm-hmm. pretend that he, he watched the tough one finale and that's fine. And by the way, I would argue that he knows just as much, if not more than me right now about the current landscape like he's watching prelims and all that. he's hardcore man amazing so that's mma hour vox media everything seems to be just hunky-dory over there ringer mma show working with bill simmons bringing in chuck bringing in pete C. how did that come about and mm. now you're what a year and change or 18 months into that journey what does the future hold for the show is it in a good spot you've had some changes recently what can you tell us Okay, so how did that come about? That was a really interesting one because uh, I guess because I was at ESPN, it's funny when you're at ESPN, everyone like wants to know about the drama and all this stuff. And then, you know, my relationship with the UFC and Dana White, um, there was an article written about my my situation in the New York Post um, written by Andrew Marchand, who's um, like a media writer. Mm. And he was writing about uh, my situation and me potentially leaving and where I could end up. And one of the places that he mentioned was uh, Metal Arc Media, which was uh, accurate. I was talking to them, Dan Lebitard and company, and uh, he mentioned them among other places. And when that article came out, uh, Bill Simmons called me and he's like, wait a second, you're going over there? And I was like, you know, uh, I, I was talking to them. He's like, no, 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 you got to come to us. I was like, well, wh- what do you got? And he, he was offering it. And, and the initial conversation was like to do basically the MMA hour with the ringer. Ultimately, I decided that I didn't want to do that for various reasons. And one day I called him, and this was super impressive. I called him to basically tell him that I was turning down the offer Mm. and he just wouldn't accept it. It was like an episode of Seinfeld. He's like, no, we're not breaking up. We're going to figure this out. And he was just so open to working with me, which really meant a lot to me. And we figured out that, you know, the puzzle could work with uh, the ringer and with Vox as like my big MMA pieces. And so one big thing for me, um, which was one of the reasons why I didn't end up going to Metal Arc was I really wanted, with everything that I did, I really tried and wanted to bring people along with me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, PT and Chuck weren't working and I really thought that, you know, we could kind of recreate what we had with the MMA beat and that wouldn't overlap um, what I was doing on the MMA hour. And they have different voices, of course. And so I wanted to try to get them in the mix. So that was a big thing for me, a big, you know, like a big push to try to get them. That's why, you know, when I went to Vox, it was big to try to get Eric to come and and work there as well. And uh, when I did my sub stack, there was a girl named Riva who I was working with at ESPN who helped me out with that too. And uh, my YouTube page, there are people who are helping me out, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I really wanted to try to get as many people that, I don't know, to just pay it back or to just help as many people as possible. And so the ringer thing was great. Um, obviously a big selling point was the live component and I love doing live and, you know, we were on Spotify live and that was great. And we met a lot of people and we had some huge wins 
And I think that we were, us and a fantasy football show, an NFL show, was were the only two real successful um, shows. And we were super successful. I mean, obviously the weigh-in with uh, Diaz and Hamza, we, we had 79,000 people listening, which is just absurd. Um, and then the post shows, we've had 10 and 11 and 12,000 people listening. But uh, ultimately, Spotify wanted to get out of that business and uh, not out of the MMA business because we're doing very well, just the live business. But they were cool enough to say, like, if you want to keep doing live, you could do Twitter spaces. All right, cool. Um, if you're cool with that, we're cool with that. So now we're just going to do Twitter spaces after the pay-per-views because ultimately, if I'm being honest, we're judged based on our podcast download numbers. Mm -hmm. And if I'm doing a show on Twitter spaces, it's kind of hurting our numbers, right? Like we're bastardizing our numbers. But for a pay-per-view post show, I think it's worth it. Um, so we're just going to do that. But the show is still strong. It's going well. It's doing better than a lot of their other shows. I'm very, very proud of that. And I'm very proud of what we did on on live. And most importantly, uh, I'm very proud of the the people and the relationships that we met. Like we, we met a lot of cool people that I didn't know existed and that were fans for a while. But this was the first time I was able to do a show that was able to connect me to this audience. And so absolutely no regrets there. And I'm I'm very happy. They've been great to work with. It's a testament to you that a sports media giant like Bill Simmons is hell bent on figuring out a way to A, work with you. And it kind of goes back to why I introduced you at the beginning of the show as such a, a loyal person, a loyal friend, a loyal colleague to say, hey, let's figure this out. Let's bring on, you know, my friends, but also incredible people in the biz like a Chuck and a Pizzi. So a tip of the cap to you on that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, going back to the, the Brandon thing, that's what pissed me off the most about what he was saying that I was like bad to work with. I was like, man. Mm. I really tried to pride myself on being the complete opposite. So who are you to say this about me? And I, I knew it was just coming from like one or two people mm. um, and not everyone's going to love you, but I've, I've really, really, really tried to help out. And by the way, I learned that from the likes of Bill Simmons. Like Bill did that at ESPN with Grantland and he did that at The Ringer. And I think that's amazing. Like if you are you know, in a, in a, in a spot, in a position to help out others and, and, and to grow. It, it can't just be me talking all the time. That's boring. It's more fun if there's other voices. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that. And again, that's something I learned from Howard. So um, the more voices, the better. And, and that was definitely a big thing for me as I was moving on. So MMA hour happens, the Ringer MMA show happens. And then all of a sudden you and me are talking and you're like, hey, um, so I'm speaking to, you know, BT Sport. I'm like, whoa, 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 what's going on? Are yeah. you coming to take my spot? Are you coming no. to take a, a social media manager role in the gig, in the company? And I was excited, I'm not gonna lie. When you told me that you were speaking to BT Sport about, you know, interviews and on camera and, and all that good stuff, I'm like, wow, I never thought I'd get to work with you again. Cause I worked yeah. with you at ESPN when I was there and, Man, I have to say, I know the initial pitch was the UFC stuff, but hasn't it just almost worked out perfectly where it's been for the most part, like 90% has been just pure WWE. Yeah. How much fun has that been for you over the last few years? God, so much fun. Like I can't even put it into words. It's amazing. Again, a negative turning into a positive. And first of all, I just want to give a shout out to you because we did kind of work together at ESPN like at the same time, but, and I hope you don't mind me saying this mm. for like, I don't know, eight, nine, I don't remember how many months you may remember, like you would do the social picture of the guests. Uh, yeah. And I actually like, I saw on my Instagram today, like a memory of one with like the nine pictures that's like the absurd amount of names. And you were just <laughs> yeah. doing those for fun. Like you would, I would tweet the lineup and you would freaking send it to me within seconds. I don't know how you did that. And uh, I always told you I appreciated it, but like publicly, I want to say I appreciate that because I didn't have someone to do that for me. And it was a big part of, you know, the growing pains over there. So thank you for that. I My really, pleasure. really appreciate it. And we'll never forget it. Um, so yeah, BT was, was, was a lot like Vox in that I, uh, I reached out to them. They didn't reach out. So I reached out to, to Mark Utting, who I, I knew from different dealings in the past. And I was like, Hey, you know, would there be a, a chance to do something? And he was surprised. Like, you want to work with us? Like, why? And I, I, I thought the BT stuff was great. Like the production was amazing. I I, uh, I knew some of the people there, like yourself, like it all just seemed great. Why wouldn't I want to work there? And and yes, the initial idea was mainly W, excuse me, UFC. Um, but uh, man, it has worked out tremendously because obviously less UFC, but now way more WWE, which I didn't really think was a thing. Like I didn't even know that was a possibility. It wasn't even really discussed. Like we discussed a little bit of WWE stuff, but not the stuff that we're doing now. Mm. And first of all, I have never in my life 
in any job, including the other ones. I've never worked with a team like the team that we have in particular on the WWE side at BT. I've never worked with people who love each other so much, who enjoy each other's company, who help each other, who root for each other, who want to be around each other, who want to work and and there's no ego and there's no backstabbing and there's no shit talking behind the scenes. Like I, I want to mention all their names because I want to give them credit, but I also am afraid that I'm going to forget someone, but like Rob and Raj and, and, and Martin and yourself and Sam and Daisy and and the other Rob and AP and and Mike and I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. Am I forgetting anyone? You would know. I think you I, nailed it. Okay, I think I nailed it. If I am, I I I, I apologize. Um, Martins as well. I mean, I, I'm trying off the top of my head. The point is, these are lovely people, and they are so freaking talented. Like the the Ariel meets series is like some of the nicest stuff that I've ever been a part of. And, uh, you know, getting to do those interviews, getting to, you know, get the, the wrestlers who a lot of them don't know me upon initial meeting. And then afterwards seeing how much they enjoy it. And then the stuff that you guys do on uh, social, it's just been so much fun, man, because I'm a fan. It's like re um, introduced me to wrestling, reinvigorated my love for wrestling. Of course, now I, I, I went and ruined it after appearing on Elimination Chamber because, you know, I'm, I'm biased and I suck, and I'm a fraud. But other than that, it's been fantastic. So uh, love that, and I and I I don't want that to end. Um, I really really enjoy that, and I'm so happy that it turned out this way. Because maybe if if I was just the UFC guy there, I, I wouldn't be doing this. Who knows? So that's been amazing. Man, you are just laying me up with the segues here. So let's go. You, you talked about the transition of working BT Sport WWE to working for WWE. And so let's go back to earlier this year, Montreal oh, yeah. Elimination Chamber, to, to break the fourth wall a little bit. Two weeks prior to the event, you and me are talking. And we're yeah. both and we're both like watching SmackDown. I'm obviously, you know, working the shift. We're, we're both watching SmackDown and we're like, man, we got to figure out a way to be there, yeah. right? And so I do my thing. I'm trying to like, hey, you know, can we get, you know, some, some budget? Can, can I get out there? I think it's a, it's a big deal. You're obviously, you know, working your magic. We both end up being there, but in completely different capacities. I'm there working for BT Sport. You're working there for WWE. Here's what I want to ask. Given what happened and given your involvement in the, in the event and everything, what did you think of the reaction from the <laughs> pro wrestling media, especially because some of those are... Friends of yours, let's be honest. Yeah. Some of them know you really, really well. You, you have history with a lot of these people going way back, ex-colleagues and what have, what have you. What was your thoughts on how they kind of reviewed and reacted to your participation there? Um, I, I was, I was to be honest, a little bit surprised and in some respects a little bit disappointed. I felt like they were projecting their own situations and values onto me. I have never claimed that I was a pro wrestling journalist. I have never wanted to be a pro wrestling journalist. I have never openly said that I wanted to be a pro wrestling journalist. And just because I interview pro wrestlers, and I do think that I am practicing journalism when I'm interviewing them, I, I, I'm not a day-to-day -day guy. I'm not a beat guy. I am not reviewing SmackDown and Raw and Dynamite and all this stuff. Um, I don't really even hardly watch them on a week to week basis. You know, I follow the accounts. I check some stuff out on YouTube and all that stuff. I'm not doing, you know, shows. I'm not hosting shows. I'm not doing podcasts, none of that. And so, you know, I think that they were almost confusing A, their situations to mine, B, me as the MMA guy and me in the wrestling world um, and, 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 and making this into a much, uh, bigger deal than it was and, and, and referencing like, oh, you've tweeted out things like, man, I could count on one hand the amount of times that I've tweeted something out. And that's just me like, you know, asking someone in PR that's hardly journalism. Okay. And, and, and the Saudi thing that I refuted, it had already been refuted by the time I tweeted. And I was just curious, like, oh, are you guys being sold by Saudi? No. Cool. I'm going to tweet that. Awesome. Thank you. That's not that's not really journalism. You know what I mean? Um, and I don't think that doing that should have any type of negative impact or reflection on me, the MMA guy, me, the boxing guy, me, the this guy, the that guy. Um, and, and to me, why I did that, if you're wondering, is twofold. Number one, 
I had been talking to them about doing some like one-off stuff here and there. And when they approached me about doing the uh, Extreme Rule, Rules VO, uh, that was the, you know, the DC appearance with Riddle and, um, and Rollins, um, I, I did it. And I was like, I'm not getting paid. You know, I don't, I don't want, I was just so, and it wasn't because wrestling journalism, this and that. I just had this rule in my mind, like you cannot get paid by any promotion, right? Like you cannot, because of what happened with the UFC and Fox. Even, even when I did, um, just to, to tell you like where my mind was when I did the Jake Paul stuff and initially like 100%, you know, it was through a recommendation by MVP I was like, I'm not doing any of this if if MVP is paying. I cannot do it. MVP did not pay me. It was showtime. When I did the face-to-face for Serrano and Taylor, I was like, I, I don't have any relationship with DAZN, but I need to be paid by DAZN. So it doesn't matter what. So I had the same mindset. Then the thing aired. I did it. I didn't get paid. Thing aired. And, and they even told me like, you're crazy. Why aren't you getting paid for it? But like, I just wanted to keep it very clean. Thing aired. I was like, man, the feeling that I had seeing my name and hearing my voice on WWE, it was like the little kid in me came out. I was like, this is so much fun. And it kind of opened my brain and idea to like, what if I did do this? Life is so short. Why don't I just go out and scratch this itch and see if it's 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 fun, if it's something di- you know completely different than what I do. So I said to myself, if an opportunity came about, uh, the next time around, I would consider it. And then they reached out about Montreal. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. It's my hometown. It's Sami Zayn. It's the arena that I went to a million times. Like I would be an idiot. I d- I could die tomorrow, and I'm going to turn down for what? Because of some dudes in in wrestling media who are going to think I, I couldn't give a f-. like if you if if you if you think less of me now, God bless. If you aren't a fan of me now, God bless. If you don't want to watch my MMA or boxing or real sports or anything else because I appeared on SmackDown and Elimination Chamber and I got paid by WWE, God bless. It's fine. I don't care anymore. I really don't. Um, I am who I am and I'm just going to do my thing and I'm going to do things that are going to make me happy. Um, you don't call me, like the people are like, you're not a real journalist. Who gives a- I'm a real Ariel Hawani. That's mm-hmm. who I am. All right. Um, and, and that's good enough for me. All right. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to take advice from people who I would never ask advice from. And um, yeah, that's it. You know, uh, I have, I, I, I don't take it personally. Like anyone who criticized me, I, I don't want to say F you and, you know, I'm not going to be your friend anymore. I'm not going to say hi to you. Uh, I just wouldn't have gone about it the same exact way, but everyone has their own, you know, path. Everyone has their own, um, you know, decisions that they have to make. And, you know, I, I would say to you here, like if they came back, I would be open to doing more. I had so much fun. It was amazing. Now, I don't want to be like, you know, I don't want to be like, let's throw it back to Ariel Hawani backstage at Raw. Like, I, I don't want to do something like that. Um something different, something bigger, but um, I am not against it. I had a lot of fun. It's crazy because I think you and me are very similar that we were pro wrestling fans first when we were kids and then combat and other sports kind of came into the fold. Isn't it bizarre to think back to when you were a kid watching these larger than life personalities, you know, during the 80s and and the 90s, and now all of a sudden you're rubbing shoulders with them, you're backstage with them, you're interviewing them, Triple H, Undertaker, you're involved in that. Isn't that crazy? Yo, it's it's like crazy is is not even being fair. Um, to me, being backstage was always like it was a bucket list thing. Like, what happens back there? Right? Like, you hear about gorilla, you hear about this, that, and those two days, and especially being home and my dad's driving me to the arena. Like all those emotions. I used to play with the LJN toys, and I had a busted ring, and I I remember like I, I had the box with all the toys. I had like fifty something toys. I had the ring with with duct tape in the middle because it broke. I had all the guys, and I would make cards. I would make matches, and my dad would tell me like, "Why are you watching this?" I would have it on in the background you're a smart boy why are you watching this nonsense he would always get mad at me and i just liked it and that fandom spawned my interest into other combat sports etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh i mean if you would have told me in 96 97 98 99 that you know triple h and you know uh taker and all these people like it it, it doesn't my, i feel like my whole life has just been one big this doesn't make sense mm-hmm. um that i win some sort of contest and and i'm so I'm kind of a negative person, so I'm so afraid of it ending, and I'm so afraid of not appreciating it, and I'm so worried about it ending, and I'm so worried about like waking up and saying like, "Man, I had all this stuff and I screwed it up." Like I'm, I'm just, I, I just don't want this to end, and uh, I want to do more, and like I can't wait for the next 
10 years. I don't want them to go quickly because I don't want my daughter to be 16. I want her to stay six forever. But um, I feel like the next 10 years could be really, really fun because now I've, I've, a friend of mine actually texted me, John Beer. He's like, it's really cool to see you finally find your voice mm. um, because he knew me as a friend and knew that on camera, like I was being professional, was worried so much about being professional. And now I, I just am, I'm the exact same guy. I'm the exact same person on camera, off camera. And that feels really great too. So yeah, all of it, all of it is just a dream. You mentioned earlier on turning a negative into a positive. When Tony Khan is tweeting you mid-show, yeah, you respond and it just blows up <laughs> social media. Like in take to take your own words, pop the boys in the back. Yeah. H- how did you even deal with that in the moment, and and what did you think of the reaction that that caused over that weekend? So um, there's a great lesson there. You know, social media is a great thing and you're a part of it and uh, it's helped us out tremendously, the both of us and so many others. Um, But someone once told me like, when you're in the middle of a show, like don't look at Twitter, don't focus on it, like just be in the moment. And uh, I actually like, as I was going out and and, and preparing for those things, I didn't look at my phone. I didn't even tweet that I was gonna be on. Like I just wanted to like let the moment live and, 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 and let it happen. And I did one hit and then there was another one coming in the second hour and I briefly looked at my phone and I saw his tweet. And so the lesson there is like, you know, I shouldn't have looked at my phone. I should have just looked at that later, but I am, I'm going to give myself the old Barry H. I was like, I'm not going to let this guy affect my moment. I'm not like going to let him ruin my moment. I'm not going to let him bring me down. I, 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 I read it. I read it multiple times. I was like, there's no way, like, did he just bury his own guy while trying to bury me? Like the whole thing looked weird, right? And then I checked, is it him? Is it the fake verified him? Like the whole thing just seemed like a big whiff. Um, but I said, I'm going to go do this. I'm not going to let this, you know, moment pass. So I didn't I didn't respond while I was there. And I also didn't want to respond like while I was there because it's my first time ever doing something for them. Like here I am going to start getting into a fight with Tony Khan backstage at a WWE event. Like what a way to start. But People were coming up to me like, do you see Tony's tweet? Do you see Tony's tweet? I was like, yeah. And then there was a part of me that was like, man, maybe I don't respond. Like maybe I just let this be. And then I get into the Uber on uh, the way home uh, to my 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 wife's parents' house, my, my in-laws. And I'm sitting there and I'm feeling good about myself. And then the tweet, the response just comes to me. And uh, I'm like, I'm just going to respond. And then I see him respond back to that. And I'm like, eh, I'm done. I, I don't really want to get into this. And then I come back the next day and then people who I have never met and people who I know, uh, people I see on TV and that you know very well were coming up to me like, man, what a reply. Great job, man. And I was like, wow, I, I couldn't even believe that they knew or cared or anything like that. And I, I was like, man, thank you. Thank you for making me into like this, uh, this hero. And then the GSP thing he's there and then they tell me go sit out with him and they're going to do like this the celebrity shot you know and i'm like me why do you want this is gsp like i i i waited in line to go to a champ sports bar on Saint Laurent street to watch him fight matt hughes i'm in the rafters when he's fighting you know against diaz and condit and all these guys he's a celebrity enough no 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 you go out with him um all right and you know before the the card starts i see michael cole he's about to go work and he's like just wait until you see how I uh, introduce you. I was like, yeah, I'm sure he's going to say like friend of the company, whatever. And then the moment happens and we're going crazy. And then you, I think were one of the first ones to text me about it. And then a bunch of other people text me about what, what Cole said. And then I was like, wow, this is nuts. Am I in the middle of some pro wrestling war right now? What is happening here? This is crazy. Again, one of those things that are crazy. Being there for that was nuts. And then the coolest part honestly was um, we did a thing at the presser yeah. and I'm leaving and I see Sammy and then I just spent like 30 minutes with Sammy, his wife and his, his wife's friend. And we just played like Montreal geography. Like, Oh, you know that person? Or you've been to this restaurant. And I was like, this guy just had like the match of his life, right. In the moment of his life. And how the hell did I end up back here? Just talking about the city that we both love. Just the whole thing was very surreal. So yeah, I'm not going to let someone like Tony Khan ruin my moment, my mood, my dream, anything like that. I wish for his sake, he didn't do it, didn't affect me whatsoever. 
could care less what he thinks about me. I think in a different lifetime, we probably are friends. We're both around the same age. We both love wrestling. We both love sports. It's a shame that, you know, the relationship got off on the wrong foot. Um, and it's a shame that he he tweeted that. But honestly, if I saw it, it's the same thing I say about Dana or Ali or any of these guys. Like if I saw Tony now, I would say, what's up, man? Let's bury the hatchet. Let's, let's, let's be pals. Do you want to come on the show? Do you want to hang out? Do you want to go for, I, I, I really believe in not holding grudges and I really mm. believe in not having enemies. And I know people think I have all these enemies, but I, I really don't. It's like, I only start it if they come to me. Like, that's the way I, I start talking. I, I never go out and seek it. So I, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to hold that grudge. I, I wish them the best. By the way, if you know anything, sorry for going long, but if you know anything about me as far as my MMA work, I'm the one who's always rooting for the second company, the third company. I'm the one who's right. trying to give Bellator shine, and PFL shine, and One Shine, Cage War, all these people, right? So wh why would I feel differently about pro wrestling? I think it's great for the boys in the back to have an alternative for leverage, for money, for all that. It's the business, the WWE product is better when there's an alternative. So I'm not rooting for them to fail. In fact, I'm, I'm rooting for them to succeed. And last thing, people know, I have said publicly way nicer things about AEW's product than WWE's product over the last two years. In fact, I was on Simmons' show saying that I liked AEW better. I've talked to you about this, right? I think you could about that. I that I've enjoyed Dynamite more than SmackDown or Raw. So it's all nonsense. Well, you answered my follow-up. You're open to letting bygones be bygones. And even though you didn't enjoy the first interview with Tony Khan, you're absolutely open to having another conversation with him, another interview with him, and piecing sure. it out at some point down the road. Absolutely. Amazing. Right. Well, I know I'm taking up a lot of your time, but I want to quickly, there's so many gigs that you have. So I want to quickly get through some of these. You're a, okay. a bet MGM ambassador. Um, you're working for Real Sports HBO, which I was a little familiar with, uh, but being you know raised in the UK, I kind of had to do a little digging around, but I do understand what a big deal that is. Uh, Showtime Sports, like, could you summarize how these opportunities came about, what they mean to you and uh, and and how you've enjoyed those experiences as well so far? Yeah, BetMGM. Uh, I knew a guy named Ryan Spoon who worked for ESPN. He went to work for BetMGM. And when I'm thinking about dividing the pie, I'm like, oh, you know, the gambling thing, maybe I can do stuff. Combat is big over there. And that has been great. Their whole team has been great. We've done some meetups. I've really, really enjoyed that. They're just low key. They're fun. They don't take themselves too seriously. It's been fantastic. The HBO thing was a huge like personal achievement for me. My first job in TV was working at HBO as an intern in 2003, and I'm like working on this show. In fact, it was a it was a, it was a specific. So, it, Real Sports is like the 60 minutes of sports, if that means anything. And the first story that I worked on that whole summer for them in 2003, when I'm a junior going into my senior year, was on pro wrestling, on wrestlers dying young. And so, 19 years later, I'm a correspondent. And uh, you know they're 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 offering me this opportunity, and I'm doing like the wacky stories, uh, bird watching. There's another story that we've already done a bunch of stuff for, and that should hopefully come out this summer. That is even wackier than the bird watching one. And so I like the fact that I'm kind of the wacky guy and and not taking myself too seriously with that. Showtime, I I, I have to give a shout out to Nikisa Bedarian of MVP. Like he put in the word for me um, for the 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 Jake Woodley fight, and that opened the door. I, you know, I had been talking to them and I knew Brian Daly over there and obviously I knew Steven Espinoza, but we hadn't really done anything and that led to some other stuff. And, you know, just recently it, it was announced that I'm going to work on the Tank Davis, Ryan Garcia fight with their great team. They're awesome, those guys. So yeah, and and like I said, there's a couple other things in the, the oven as well. Um, I just, there's a couple times recently where I was like, how did I get this lucky? How did all the pieces fit? how is there not one like stinker job here? The one that I can't wait to get rid of, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just keep thinking to myself, man, I don't want this to end. I enjoy this too much. Plus my, the the YouTube page that, you know, I revived and, uh, you know, uh, recently had an interview with the great Brennan Johnson. Of course, you know, I'm a big uh, footy fan now. You say ambassador for Ben MGM. I mean, dare I say about Ben MGM, excuse me, an ambassador for Nottingham Forest. Um, the great, you know, uh, club out of Nottingham. So that has been fun. And there's a lot more stuff coming to that page too. Not just my voice, which I'm very excited about. Um, other people like the goals that you click on a video there and it's not me at all, that there's mm -hmm. other people there. So I'm very, very excited about that as well. And uh, yeah, the social stuff. I met this uh, young man named Spencer, who's been doing, as you know, like, I don't know how to do that. 
and he helped me with my Instagram, my 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 TikTok as well. So yeah, it feels like feels like a great time. I'm very very happy and and feel so grateful and appreciative. I want to be very respectful of the time that you're giving. So no problem, two no final problem. two final no things. One of the things that I'm curious to understand, I'm not a parent, you are. When it comes to smartphones and social media, how do you and your wife um, handle that with your kids? Because we, I guess, kind of you know grew up at the same time where our first you know mobile phone, cell phone wasn't a smartphone. You can call and text. That was it. It's yeah. a completely different world now. So how do you guys deal with that? Man, it's very scary and it's um, it's a little bit depressing because I don't like if it was up to me. I got my first phone at 21 mm -hmm. and I would love if we could wait to 21. Obviously that's not possible in this day and age. Um, and the problem is not so much the rules that we have, it's really the rules that their friends have, right? Because once one kid shows up with an Apple watch or a phone, like it's kind of game over. So my son, my oldest son is in fifth grade. He's turning 11 next month. And like, I, 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 I sense it coming. I, I feel it coming. Um, and, and this worries me. The iPad is their only device at the moment. And even that we try to limit. And there's constant battles about that. And um, I don't let them go on Twitter or Instagram or TikTok. They have no idea how to use that. The one thing though that I must say like worries me a little bit is they are obviously on YouTube and, and that's like, that's what they do, right? Like YouTube, like you and I, like we would sit down in front of the TV and it's like, oh, what's on? That's, mm. they don't even know how to do that. They don't even know how to turn on like cable or anything like that. They turn on YouTube and that's a problem. Um, the shorts are a problem because they just sit there and it's like, broom, broom, and, and it's pretty much acting like reels or TikTok. And I, I've asked them repeatedly not to go on shorts because I don't want their attention spans to, to minimize. Um, so that worries me as well. Uh, luckily, they're very good kids. And luckily right now, they are obsessed with soccer. And so all day I see what's on their thing and it's just soccer highlights. And I could dig that. I'm, I'm happy. Like, a, you know, there was a period where they were watching like this, like kind of wacky, you know, I, I like, I, I'm not trying to put them down, but like Mr. Beast like stuff, these mm -hmm. pranks and all that. And I didn't love that. But if they're sitting there watching Man City highlights, I can't hate on them. That's, that's pretty awesome. I, I'm not, I'm not going to get too mad about that. Um, and they play soccer a lot. So I'm, I'm happy about that, but yes, it's very scary. And I worry about, you know, bullying and people ganging up and feeling left out of conversations and, and, and group chats and Snapchat and all this crap, but it's just, you know, it's the world that we live in and it has brought a lot of good to us. It has connected us, but there's obviously some bad and, you know, it's on us as parents to, to try to be the best that we can be to, to limit and to, to shield them from it as much as possible. Well, good luck with that. Cause it's, yeah. it's a challenge. It certainly is. Um, okay. Well, you might like this. I'm going to be ending all my kind of interviews and conversations on a bit of a, a light and fun note here, Ariel. Okay. And it's going to, and it's going to be different with every guest every single week. So it's quick fire. Okay. I'm going to answer, I'm going to ask you some questions, right? And all you can do, because I know you love the Brits, I know you're enamored by the British culture, love, love and I know the Commonwealth, everything, right? Love it. You can only reply with, yes, bruv, okay. or, or nah, bruv. Okay, is that what you say? You say nah? I say nah, bruv, yes, bruv, nah, bruv, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, I yeah. know about bruv, I didn't know about the nah, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, Great. yeah. Okay, so here we go. Okay. Will Jake Paul have an MMA fight. Now, I do want to say <laughs> here. Uh, okay, well, it depends on the question, of course, but like for this yeah. particular one, this is gut. This is not like, because I think sometimes I, I give an opinion and people think that, oh, it's, you know, if I'm asked a question, it's it's based on insider knowledge. But right now sure. you're just asking me and this is not based on insider knowledge, okay? Purely hypothetical. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I'm going to say nah, bruv. Okay. Does Francis Ngannou return to the UFC? Nah, bruv. Will you ever interview Tony Khan again? Yes, bruv. Will the Montreal Expos return as a franchise? Uh, yes, bruv, of course. I have to keep the faith. Does Brock Lesnar fight at UFC 300? Wow. I didn't think of that. I'm going to say nah, bruv. Will you ever conduct a one-on-one -on -one interview 
with Dana White again? You know what? I'm going to say yes, bro. I'm going to say yes. I it would be it would be must see TV. Maybe when we're old and gray, uh, and maybe that's naive, but I'll say yes. Does The Rock wrestle one more time for WWE? Yes, bro. Will AEW ever beat the WWE in the ratings? Nah, bro. Does Shawani. <laughs> <She'll run. laughs> Does the WWE sell for more money than the UFC did? A thousand percent, bro. Thousand percent. And finally, will we ever see the return of High Road Helwani? Wow. You know what? Sometimes I do, you know, choose my words wisely. Um, are you saying you want to see the return of High Road Helwani? I'm saying you can do what you want to do with your life, but uh, 10-7 Hilwani has been uh, pretty good for the old ratings the last couple of years. Yes. Listen, I'm not trying, again, I don't pick the fights. I just, you know, I, I answer. Um, and so I'd like to think like right now I'm high. Look, Tony Khan, Dana White, that was high road Hawani right there, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So sure, he, he is still alive and well, but when it comes to you trying to hit me below the belt, you know, it's, it's petty Wani. It's, you know, I'm not, I'm not playing that game. So that one's a bit of a yes, no, bruv. Got you. Well, that's a, a segment I'm calling the bit for social. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so that's now in the can. Ariel. Amazing. Thank you so much for being my yes. first guest. I really do appreciate it. It means the world to me. It honestly does. And like I said, I introduce you as a, a loyal colleague. I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. You are the reason that I was able to go from freelance part-time to full-time in this business. And man, it's been incredible to not only call you a friend, but now a two-time colleague in the business. So I really appreciate you being my first guest. Oh, tremendous stuff. Great questions. Uh, you know, obviously I'm uh very critical of, of interviews and interviewing and interviewers. Really great question. Again, great to see you back in the mix. Great that you got this off the ground. I wish you nothing but the best. I'll, I'll happily come back on. And yeah, thanks for everything you've done for me too, because you have. And, and, and not all of it, you know, something that you could touch, but you were a very loyal and good friend. And, and uh, you have an incredible positive view on things that I don't possess. A joie de vivre, if you will, if you know what that means, like a, a zest for life. Uh, so I appreciate that tremendously. And I'll be seeing you in LA. Yes, man. I cannot wait. Okay, I thought Angeles. you were just about to say you're not going. No, 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 no. Okay. LA WrestleMania, the BT Let's Sport go. crew is going to be there. Actually, one more question. You okay. have the you have the pencil, you have the pad, not the whole card, but Cody, Roman, book it. How does it go down? Cody wins. Mm. Cody wins. Uh, and, 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 and maybe Sammy gets involved and maybe all this stuff, but... It's, I feel like it's time. I, I, would, mm-hmm. I would put the belt on Cody. Yeah, I think he, he's earned it, deserves it, and it's the, it's the right time to kind of move into a new direction with yes. WWE. Yeah. It's been a great run. Shout out to Roman Reigns. Incredible run. And, and I, I suspect he wins it back, but just to freshen it up a little bit. Yeah. I mean, some people are calling the Bloodline one of the greatest factions of all time, and I have to agree. It's been insane. How it's been amazing. Great. But now I'd love to see, like, imagine if the Bloodline, if the Usos lose the belt, and, and he lose, like, the Bloodline in shambles would be fun like you know Heyman all disheveled and worried like we haven't seen that right we've seen dominance for three years now so it'd be nice to switch it up well we're gonna find out we're gonna be there like we said on site Wrestlemania I can't wait of, of all the events Triple H's yeah. first Wrestlemania this feels so epic yeah. and so enormous can't wait absolutely can't wait and the card as of right this second as we're speaking uh is really good and they haven't announced some of the fights or matches that we think they're gonna announce I've always been a fan of the one night as opposed to two. If I'm being honest, I feel like two is a lot. Um, and I don't even mind if it's seven hours or eight hours because UFC every week is eight hours or something yeah. like that. But uh, I love LA. I haven't been in a while and, you know, love working with you guys at BT. So it's going to be great. I can't wait. I'll see you there. And once again, thank you very much for being my first guest. Thank you. And we'll speak to you soon. <laughs>